Welcome to End of Life University on YouTube. In this video, I'm sharing with you an interview I did with Dr. Ira Bayak about his book, The Four Things That Matter Most, which is a truly inspirational book. I think you'll really enjoy this conversation. So take a listen. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to this channel down below and also subscribe and leave a rating and review for the podcast wherever you happen to listen. If you enjoy this content and you'd like to make a little contribution to help keep us on the air, you can go to eoluniversity.com slash support and you'll find three different ways you can make a donation that will make a huge difference to me and End of Life University. So we'll move on now with my conversation with Dr. Ira Bayak. Today, I'm very happy to welcome back my frequent guest, Dr. Ira Bayak. Dr. Bayak is a leading palliative care physician, author, and public advocate for improving care through the end of life. He is Emeritus Professor of Medicine and Community and Family Medicine at the Dartmouth Giesel School of Medicine and a past president of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. His books include Dying Well, The Best Care Possible, and The Four Things That Matter Most, which we'll be discussing today. And you can learn more about Dr. Bayok's work at his website, irabayok.org. So Ira, welcome back. It's good to see you again. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, I I'm, uh, was looking back through the archives, and you know, this year is the 10th anniversary of End of Life University. I started it. I got the URL and started doing interviews 10 years ago, and you were actually one of the very first people I interviewed back then uh, because the best care possible had come out not too long before mm -hmm. that, yep. and I, I had met you once at an AAHPM meeting in Denver, and um, I just in, I emailed you and I thought, there's no way Ira Bayak is going to agree to do an interview with me. I'm like nobody. And you said yes. And so uh, so here we are 10 years later. We've recorded a number of interviews during that time and we're friends. And so that's really wonderful. Uh, well, you're not nobody. I don't think you were. I think you were somebody then, but you're definitely somebody now. Congratulations on 10 years of a very successful podcast. Yeah, it's it's been a really fun journey, but I'm, you know, I'm forever grateful to you though because you agreed to be interviewed that actually gave me confidence that it's okay to ask people. Like the worst anyone could say is no or not respond, but you gave me hope that some people actually say yes, and so I really appreciated that. Well, it's always been a pleasure. Um really and truly, I thank you for the work you're doing. It's really wonderful stuff. Yeah, we've we've had great conversations in the past, but I realized like I had never asked you about your book, The Four Things That Matter Most. And uh, to be honest, every time I've interviewed you, I've gotten dozens of messages from people who say, oh, Dr. Bayak's book, The Four Things That Matter Most is why I went into hospice, or it changed everything for me about my work, or it helped me so much. And I thought I'd, I get more comments about that book than anything else. And I realized, gosh, we need to just talk about it. Well, it's a pleasure. Uh, I, um, you know, I wrote it uh, to try to empower people and to frankly change our culture in a very constructive way. And so it's always a pleasure to talk about it. No, I, I know it's been a while since you wrote that book and that you're coming up on an anniversary next year, I think. For Is that, that right? Book. I guess so, right? I guess so. It's been it'll be 20 years. That's 20, right. Yeah, 20 years, which is really phenomenal. I mean, yeah, it's amazing. Time flies by. But boy, oh boy. but it's a book that persists. I you know, I, I mean I hear like I said, I hear from people frequently who are reading it for the first time right now. So it's a book that never ages that anyone could pick up and read right now, and it's relevant. Uh, for everyone, really, whether you work in the end of life field or whether you're a patient or whether you're just a human being who's who's looking at end of life issues, it's well, it's true. Uh, I, you know, I think uh, the four things is is a bit of practical wisdom that 
I, and frankly, many of us have brought from our clinical practice, caring for people with serious life-limiting illnesses, that has practical importance or value to us at any time in our lives. So it's, um, you know, again, it's it, it's something that uh, I do want to continue to call attention to. I'm delighted that it it continues to find readers uh, now, 20 years after I, uh, it was first published. But um, but it's all, you know, it, it, it does feel fresh to me even today. Yeah, and I was going to say 20 years ago, um, as I recall, there weren't that many books being written about end-of-life situations by hospice and palliative care doctors. And uh, so I was curious to know what inspired you to write the book, and did you have any trouble getting it published at that time? Oh, man, those are two very different uh, uh, topics. Um, uh, what inspired me to write it was this notion that um, people ought to have an opportunity to feel complete in their lives and particularly particularly their relationships before they're forced to say goodbye to one another. Uh, and, you know, I mean complete in a relationship much like, um, you know, a circle is complete uh, when it's unbroken, not complete like things are ending necessarily, but complete like there's nothing left undone, nothing left unsaid. And it occurred to me that, you know, so many people who are seriously ill um, don't have the advantage of having really good palliative or hospice care. They don't, they're not going to get this guidance um, from mainstream healthcare professionals. And here's a little bit of practical wisdom that frankly is um, non-toxic, like you know, you have to be very careful about counseling because it's pretty easy to um, have good intentions and still screw things up. But in this situation, um, you know, asking for forgiveness, expressing forgiveness, expressing gratitude and love are pretty safe. And if you're not doing it in a manipulative way, if you're really doing it out of good intentions, boy, this one seems like a, a bit of wisdom that I could help um, uh, spread, make available in non-clinical, general ways that um, um, that I, I'm not going to worry is going to have adverse consequences, right? It may not work, but and we can talk about that, Karen. But my sense is that it's pretty safe, at least. Uh, and I and I frankly worried then, and I still worry now that um, you know people aren't going to have the sort of um, nuanced, sensitive counseling that I think everyone should be should have available to them as they're facing serious life limiting illness, and um, and therefore you know, the end in life of these very serious, uh, very important relationships. So there yeah, you go. It's, yeah, it's a little bit, just a little bit subversive because I, I want to empower people to do for themselves what in a, in a perfect world, we'd all have good counseling to do and help to do uh, in our, in our journey through illness. And and I like that you you wrote in the book that these are actually simple things in a sense. I mean they're they're simple, not they're hard to do, but simple yeah. concepts. And four of them, four is a good number for us to hold in our memories and something we can could actually hope to achieve. Four things, and right. so I think there's a there's a real brilliance to that in a way for everyone that it's not hard to grasp these these four concepts that you stayed in the book. Right. And, and by the way, you know, it started as five things. People often would ask me because in Dying Well, which was my first book, I talked about uh, saying five things before you die. Please forgive me. I forgive you. Thank you. I love you. And goodbye. And 
for more than a decade. I talked about that in every talk I gave and every article I wrote and all this. And not uncommonly, after a talk at a, either a medical center or some community event, talking about usually at that time in my career, hospice care, somebody would come up to me and say, you know, Dr. Bayak, I loved your talk. I love those five things are wonderful. But you know, you don't have to be dying for those things to, to really have value. And for about a decade, Karen, I would say, you know, you're absolutely right. Thank you so much. I, you know, really appreciate that. Eventually, I decided um, people are trying to teach me something here, and and while I get it, um, I bet all those people who say that have a story. So I started when when somebody would say that to me, I'd say, "I'll bet you have a story." I'd love, can you mind if I get in touch with you? You have an email or a phone number. I could could we get in touch? And I'd interview them and and start to collect their stories. Um, and um, and that kind of grew into, um, gee, I could put this out there as practical wisdom from the end of life that has value at any time of life. That's so true. And the book is filled with really wonderful stories with, uh, I mean, a lot of detail that shows that you you really listened and heard what people were we're trying to tell you. And I loved that sometimes the stories would intertwine or you would hear a story of a person was telling you, but they would have a sibling who had a different experience that they would recount as well. And it, I really love the way you, you tied all the stories together within the book. Well, there's some hard stories in that book, right? You know, one of the, um, um, <laughs> one thing that happened, and I think I, I mentioned this in the intro to the to the tenth uh, anniversary edition. Is uh, uh, I was doing this uh, the these satellite interviews, uh, which you know, unless you're really famous, they don't send you on book tour anymore. They send you on satellite interviews where you sit in your office and you do drive time radio interviews with uh, around the country, usually marching kind of east to west in the morning drive time and then again in the af late afternoons or early evenings and uh i was i think live in philadelphia one early one morning and this uh um radio interviewer said to me uh, dr Bayaka, uh, i read your book it's very good he and he actually said that uh but then he said but um i wonder why would anybody buy it because you give the book away in the first 11 words <laughs> And, you know, he had me, boy, because the, the first 11 words of the first edition of the book are, please forgive me, I forgive you, thank you, I love you, goodbye. And for a moment, I had to think, and, you know, and my recovery was in, in being honest and saying, because it, it sounds ridiculous. Without the stories, it all sounds so glib and, and preposterous. Um, and frankly, you know, I picked some really hard stories to tell, uh, stories about fractured relationships. And my hope is that people reading or even our listeners here this morning, um, in, in reading stories that may resonate with fractured relationships in their lives, they might have their own realm of the possible expanded. They may expand their imagination to think, huh, maybe I could heal that relationship. Um, and and so, you know, it's worth it. The, the stories are, are what really um, carry this. Uh, otherwise, you know, if, if I didn't do this work, if I hadn't seen or interviewed people who have done this in real life, I wouldn't believe it either, right? I'm just not that, you know, you know me uh, personally, I'm just not that woo-woo. I'm, I'm just not, I, I have to see it. Yeah, yeah. And like you, 
I witnessed it over and over again, the power of forgiveness at the end of life between patients and their family members. And I remember thinking, maybe this only can only happen at the end of life. Maybe you have to be dying in order to reach a point where you actually can forgive someone for something really hard. But I later came to understand that I think we can work on forgiveness at any time in our lives, but, um, but talk to me more about that. Cause you heard people practicing forgiveness who were not dying. Well, it's true. You know, I had, I did a lot of psychiatry in medical school. Uh, I was very interested in psychiatry, not as a career, but just cause I wanted to learn it. Um, and in psychiatry where I, w- I trained at the university of Colorado and it was a pretty psychoanalytic psychiatry department. And I I sat through a lot of psychiatry rounds and, and conferences and like, and the sense was that real change in relationships took a long time, usually years with, you know, very frequent uh, therapy appointments and on and on and on. And then I got out into um, training, actually. uh, And for whatever reasons was really drawn to working with people who are seriously ill. And I saw that when push came to shove, sometimes dramatic changes in relationships happened over a short period of time. And, and they were real. And so I began to realize that, that um, realizing that time is short, that one or the other of people in a you know important loving or once loving at least relationship um, realized that time was short, that sometimes it acted as a catalyst for real change, that standing in front of the, you know, the monolith of, um, of eternity, (laughs) uh, sometimes the, um, infractions, the, the transgressions, the anger that divided us began to look proportionally smaller to the history and the the bonds that uh, brought us together. And I saw that again and again, and gradually, carefully, uh, I began to try to use it therapeutically. Um, You know, my counseling technique around this um, has never been to say to a, a, a seriously ill patient or their family, you know, you really should do this. Uh, before Joe gets any sicker, you really should say, not, it's just not my style. But I will kind of shoulder to shoulder with them, listening to their feelings and what feels left unsaid and what feels broken. I will wonder aloud whether it might not have value for them to say these four things to one another, because I've known, I've seen over the years, not uncommonly, it has value for people I've known. And in that wondering aloud, I've, um, I've counseled and supported people in, you know, um, in taking the chance of, of saying these things. And as you've mentioned, often with really remarkably positive uh, results. And I I like that you mentioned the power of saying the words, because I think sometimes when people contemplate forgiveness, it seems daunting, like, well, that would, that would take forever. How could I possibly do that? But that there's, there's power in just saying the words, um, please forgive me, I forgive you. That seems to shift something in a way that that may actually help us have breakthroughs more easily than if we sp- spend all our time in therapy trying to to work work through the issues. Exactly. I think you know I start um, presenting these four things to people uh, with an acknowledgement that um, human beings are imperfect, right? We can all strive for perfection and I, you know, want to encourage people to do that. But um, just know as you strive that at the end of the day, you're likely to still be imperfect. We are, we are just human beings, right? And so, you know, one piece of practical wisdom, have some mercy for yourself and for others, because 
you know, we're just human. Um, once you start from that, then uh, forgiveness is really part of the magic of all of this. Um, we can we can acknowledge our imperfections and and simply ask, you know, uh, for forgiveness. It's it's interesting. People um, people often ask me, Dr. Bayaka, um, you know, uh, how has the work that you've done uh, changed your personal life? And you know, I, I wish I could say that uh, I've become incredibly patient and. Uh, I don't sweat the small stuff and I never get irritable, you know, but uh, as you know, you know, my wife, Yvonne, and that, that, that answer wouldn't fly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, um, you know, I remain a work in progress. I'm trying, uh, but what the work has done and what I've learned from people I've had the privilege of accompanying through the end of life is that, um, that apologies matter. And I, I've learned to apologize more quickly and more kind of thoroughly or authentically than I did as a young man. Uh, you know, I never, again, I mean, I used to say, uh, it's it's cringeworthy now, but I used to say, uh, I'm sorry your feelings got hurt, mm -hmm. right? Notice the passive voice as if <laughs> as if it was a, a natural event. Oh, I'm sorry, lightning struck your house. <laughs> right. Uh, nowadays, you know, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. I'm sorry I screwed up again. And I've learned that apologies are are a bit magical because in what they convey is that our relationship matters more than the regret and the embarrassment I feel about having screwed up yet again. Remarkably, almost paradoxically, I found that in doing that, and you know, and it's uncomfortable to do, but in really doing it, often the relationship somehow is stronger for, for um, the process. Now, I mean, I, I don't say that to suggest that you become cantankerous like I am or, you know, irritable to, you know, mend and tend your relationships. But but the fact is that, you know, when you screw up, doing this really does reinvest in a relationship in a way that, in at least in my experience, has been very healthy. And, you know, I think it's made me a better husband and father and brother and, you know, and by the way, I think a better physician. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I can agree with that as well. I've been noticing these days, so this, these are things I read on social media, but a lot of pushback against the idea of saying, I forgive you to someone who's caused harm to you because it feels as though, well, wait, you shouldn't, that person's a perpetrator and you shouldn't let them off the hook. They should suffer the consequences of their actions. And I see people resisting the idea of forgiveness. And yet the act of forgiving someone else can be so powerful for us as well. That's the point. Th this is, this is ultimately about um, oneself. Um, you know, my desire in offering this counseling uh, this bit of practical wisdom is frankly for my readers in all honesty this is a it turns out um, that forgiveness is a valuable tool for uh, one's own well-being you know people people misunderstand forgiveness they think it's about absolving somebody for their misdeeds or you know removing their um culpability or their responsibility and it has nothing of the sort, right? Um, one of the most stupid things I, I uh, you know, know from um, contemporary culture is that phrase "forgive and forget." How absurd! Uh, forgetting is amnesia, right? To forgive somebody, you actually have to remember their misdeed, how they hurt you, right? Um, but it is a practical tool for self-care. It's it's a bit like uh, emotional economics. 
right? If somebody uh, buys something from you or you have a store and they buy something on time and they never, you give it to them and they never finish paying or, right, you, you loan them something and it never comes back. Uh, every time you see that person, you get you can get angry and you the 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 you know and on a on a financial on your store's bottom line that debt grows interest and gets larger and right and grows. It does so emotionally as well. In business, we can take the loss one time, write it off. Now, that doesn't mean that you forget the debt entirely you know, psychologically or emotionally, it's likely you're not going to allow that person to buy something else on time. You know, you don't, one doesn't, to change metaphors, one doesn't put their hand back on the hot stove after you've been burnt, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it allows you to be free of the emotional baggage that you're carrying around. Your expectations of that person may change. Right? If somebody has been mean or even hateful, or you can forgive them for who they are, for their own emotional wounding. You can think of them as a baby. This is one of the things that I do is, well, they were once uh, a loving baby, but they got screwed up along the way. Um, I'm not going to have much more to do with them if I can avoid it. But I'm going to get free of the anger that I'm carrying around that's, you know, impacting my own emotional well-being. That's the key here, right? So it's about us. It's about, th these are tools for self-care, for, for emotional well-being. Exactly. It's so toxic to carry that kind of anger and resentment constantly towards someone else. And if you can just let it go and let go of that burden, it doesn't mean that you even have to continue a relationship with that person or ever see them again, right. if you choose not to, but to not be holding on to resentment is so much better for your health and well-being. Right. And I, and I also want to be clear. I mean, anger is an entirely healthy emotion. And if you've been harmed, if somebody has been intentionally mean or hurtful to you and you want to be angry, that's that's your right. And it's and at least in the short run, it's also very functional. It's energizing and it allows you to to defend yourself or to protect yourself. Um, but in the long run, it's not the only healthy, legitimate option to having been harmed. There is another one, which is, you know, forgiving the person and then deliberately letting it go. And you, and you write in the book too, that sometimes the forgiveness that's needed is actually for ourselves, that sometimes we, we become our own worst enemies in a way we hold on to self blame and regret and guilt. And um, that that can be, it can be really hard to accomplish that as well, or even to get people to recognize that they need to forgive themselves. It's not uncommonly the hardest relationship we have to, to mend and tend in our, our lives as our relationships with ourselves. You know, many of us um, uh, grew up as human doings rather than human beings. You know, you know, I, I'm an adult child of Jewish parents. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it's a condition that has no known cure. <laughs> and, and I grew up in a very loving family and I was told I was a good boy and, you know, but being good had, had expectations. It, 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 I had to do stuff. I had to get good grades. I had to write my aunts and uncles thank you cards without being reminded after holidays or, you know, um, birthdays when I got presents. And, you know, I had to clean my room and, and you know, um, sweep the floor after dinner every night without being reminded, right? All of that. And it was like being good has a half-life and would sort of de deteriorate <laughs> if you didn't re-up it, re recharge yeah. it. Right. But the fact is, we are just human beings. We are imperfect human beings who, and that's good enough. Right. And so that forgiveness for not being perfect, for all of the stuff that the disappointments that we've had, for not having, you know, lived up to our parents' expectations or not having 
lived up to our own fondest dreams that for whatever reasons has have remained out of our reach, uh, I think is important. My What I often uh, suggest to people uh, um, as a piece of uh, really good advice is um, get over it, right? You're just human. It's good enough, right? Um, bring some love and forgiveness and love to yourself. Exactly. Exactly. That's so powerful. And, and so it, it really makes sense, this spectrum of forgiveness of forget the forgiveness we give to others, we give to ourselves and then seeking forgiveness for ourselves, I guess, by apologizing to other people just to mend all those old rifts and fractures in our relationships. But I, I love the fact that the third thing that matters most is thank you. And uh, it reminded me of a patient I took care of a few years ago with breast cancer. She had a, a fractured relationship with her older sister who had some mental health issues. And um, they were estranged from each other, hadn't connected for a long time. And the patient kept telling me, I've forgiven her. I've forgiven her for everything, but I don't want to see her and I don't need to see her. I don't need her in my life. And about two weeks before she died, she suddenly decided I need to see my sister. And she, her husband called and had the sister fly out to see her. And I said, why, what changed? And she said, I realized that I need to tell her thank you. And um, she said, because I would not be who I am today if were it not for my sister. And she said, because of my sister's struggles, I decided to become a social worker. And I've had this amazing career. I've loved my work so much. And I need to thank my sister because her being who she is shaped me in a way that let me become who I am today. And that was the most beautiful story I'd heard and how naturally saying thank you can flow after the act of forgiveness in a way as a natural next step. That's a great story. Exactly. Uh, you know, once, once we say these things to one another, to particularly if the relationship has been troubled, um, there is a lightness that emerges and, and particularly after the please forgive me's and I forgive you's. Gratitude for just sharing uh, our lives together uh, or our, you know, childhoods together or our time, you know, in grade school or college together, whatever it is, that um, that's something precious and is inherently meaningful very healthy. And I, I know you had a story in the book about a young man who was estranged from his father who'd been abusive. The, the, the young man had had a terrible childhood with his father, but was able to say, thank you for giving me life. I, you know, I wouldn't even exist without you. And so sometimes maybe that's all we can say. That's all, all we can be grateful for. But to be alive is pretty special. Yes. So in that story, by the way, uh, um, it, which is a story from Lynn Halamash, uh, an Israeli counselor who was using the five things and wrote me about this story about a very dysfunctional family and abused, emotionally abused child whose father was then years later when, when Avi, his name was, was a, a an adult was his father was his biological father really only was dying. Uh, Lynn really pushed him to say, please forgive me. I forgive you. Thank you. And I love you. And he had a hard time doing it. He did it because his, his own mother was pushing him to, to work with this counselor, Lynn Halamash and do these things. Uh, and so he, he basically had to say, I love you kind of as a question. You know, because <laughs> Lynn had said, we all love our parents. You can't help it. You, you know, um, I love you. And in the story and in real life, his father, his biological father, was able to say, thank you. And I love you, too. Beautiful ending, real story of a fractured relationship that healed and that Avi really was much changed by this. He got rid of a really toxic anger that he had been carrying around his entire adolescence and, and adult life. 
But I'm asked often, well, what would have happened had uh, Simon was the biological father's name, um, said, ah, get out of here. You know, well, you were a rotten kid. I never liked you. I, I don't give a damn. Right. Um, what I've done in those circumstances is I try to, in some counseling, prepare people that they can only take care of their side of the relationship and that they should not try to say these things in a way that is dependent on some specific response or a like, uh, you know, an emotionally um, hoped for uh, response of forgiveness and gratitude from the other person. You can only take care of your side of the relationship. But if you're showing up and you're arriving with good intentions, in my experience, even if the other person isn't having any of it, the person I've been counseling feels better for having made the good faith effort. They know that they've done what they can do uh, and, and you know, feel good about having tried. I think that's such important wisdom too, to not have expectations of how it may turn out or what the other person will say, because we could set ourselves up for disappointment. And as you've emphasized, it's really just about us accomplishing this, us saying the words, us uh, helping to heal our own, our own fractures within whether or not the other person can respond to it or receive it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so that that's really valuable advice. And and again, I, I do see it come up. Well, if someone has had a horribly abusive parent, they shouldn't ever say, I forgive you directly to the parent, which I don't know that I agree with that or not, but some people may not want to be in the presence of, of their loved one. Again, they may not want to so, be face-to-face -to, -face to say right. those words. So all of this is is optional, right? First of all, and again, if you've been harmed, if you had an abusive father and you are furious and angry and you want to stay angry, you have my blessing, right? You, it's it's totally legitimate. It's authentic. Um, it's just not the only option. In um, in for in offering forgiveness, uh, one is taking care of oneself. Right. Um, the other person is imperfect. Um, and so do it or, or you know, or not uh, is the best I can, I can say. Well, I know you wrote a little bit about uh, sometimes people who've had a loved one who's already died and they didn't have an opportunity to have this conversation um, while that person was alive, uh, you wrote in the in the introduction to the the second edition a, a little bit about that. It's like well, the, that there's still value in practicing these four statements even when someone has already died. You know, life ends, uh, death ends a life, but not a relationship. Um, in a very real sense, I, I I said at the beginning, I'm not really a woo woo kind of a guy. But in a very real way, if you just pay attention to your own thoughts and feelings, relationships go go forward even when somebody has died. Uh, my uh, my relationship with my parents is very much in my thoughts. I mean, yesterday was Father's Day as we're recording this, mm -hmm. and I was actively thinking about my dad. But it but he comes up not uncommonly in my thoughts. He's he populates my dreams from time to time, and I have conversations with him. And 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 the same, I could say the same thing about you know some other people, close friends of mine, who have who have died. Um, it's so within myself that relationship is alive, and within myself, I can bring a a authentic sense of. Um, forgiveness and gratitude and love uh, toward my father and mother. And maybe we'll talk about my mom in a moment, but, um, but that those relationships continue. Now, if you've had a particularly difficult, really 
dysfunctional or abusive relationship with a, let's say, a parent who has died, um, you may, this may be a situation where you really do want some counseling and really do want to work with a skilled uh, grief counselor to craft ways that for you would be um, authentic expressions toward the other person. I think I may have said this in the introduction, but I can't remember, but I know counselors who use, you know, the empty chair technique of being in counseling and imagining having a, an empty chair in the room and imagining the offending parent or individual in that chair. And what would you say to that person? And just doing that, saying it out in, in out loud and working through that is often emotionally very powerful and feels very, very real. Again, you know, I have no idea if the person who has died has any consciousness or any responsiveness. Uh, I'm not, this is not metaphysical. It's not my realm. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that on an emotional level, the emotional reality of people, sometimes things shift. And I know uh, any number of stories of people. I tell a story of, of somebody who was a news anchor in, in the Southwest who interviewed me after this book came out. And, uh, and after we were off camera and our mics, we were unmiked, he said, I got to tell you a story. And he told me a story of an abusive relationship that his, his father was abusive to him. And after his father died, um, he was really troubled and he drove through the night to San Juan Capistrano, mm -hmm. uh, where his family used to visit. And he sat in the, in the beautiful chapel in, in San Juan Capistrano and just brought his father to mind. And he said to me, um, and I wept for almost two hours. Wow. And then when I was out of tears and I left the chapel, I was so aware that something had changed and my relationship with my father was really different. Somehow I was now at peace with my father for who he was and who I am as his son. Like, whoa. Yeah, that's a beautiful story. And such a good, good reminder that we can, we can do this kind of work of forgiveness anytime in our lives, whether our loved ones are with us or alive or not, because we're doing internal work on ourselves, really. Right, exactly. It's all about us. And I find that once you've said these things to, to somebody you love and in my life, my daughters, my wife, my sister, um, our relationship is just lighter for it. There's this sense of celebration that there's nothing critically important left unsaid. We know we're imperfect together, but what a hoot to be sharing this life together, right? I want to say, uh, talk a, a bit about my mom. So um, my mom was a, um, you know, a pretty typical Jewish mom. And I, I mean that we always laugh about, oh, you're, you know, having a Jewish mom. And and legitimately, but she was an overbearing, you know, mother and was intrusive and um, I could never, you know, do enough and all of that mishagas, as they say, all of it. Um, we didn't have a perfect relationship and I wasn't hardly a perfect son to her. I drove her crazy when I was a adolescent and young adult and you know, worried her mostly because at the time, you know, I was, you know, in my hippie years and I was hitchhiking across country multiple times. And this poor woman had to drop me off at times at a, at a uh, highway ramp and I'd wave goodbye to her. And then she wouldn't hear from me for a week or more. And I can't even imagine as a parent myself, I can't <laughs> yeah, imagine. I was say that a mother's worst nightmare. <laughs> oh my God. Um, my mother um, never read, um, well, never, never lived to see the four things that matter most be published. But she read the galleys of the book before it was published. And I had to have the talk with her. 
Uh, otherwise, I, you know, I, I couldn't be legitimate myself, right? So in the very latter stages of, of, of writing and submitting this book for publication, and, and, uh, and I say that with all honesty, I was late in doing this, but I, we sat down and we had the talk. And I, I you know, asked her for forgiveness for driving her crazy and knowing that I was not always attentive as I should have been. And I forgave her for driving me crazy at times and for being at times overbearing. And, and, uh, and I thanked her profusely for being my best friend and my steadfast supporter and all her incredible generosity toward me. And, and, you know, I told her without any reservation that I loved her dearly. It was very important for us to have that conversation. And, and our relationship, I think, got substantially lighter. It had, it had already been good by that time in our, you know, our years, our adult years. But I'm telling you this story because uh, within three months of reading the galleys, my mom died suddenly mm. uh, in a car. We thought she'd had a car accident. We got the call and we've been told that she, she was in a car accident and had died. But actually, it turns out she had uh, had a, dissected her uh, thoracic uh, aortic aneurysm and she died in the car and just rolled into the car in front of her. Mm. Um, and I miss her. And I wish there's so much I, I wish I could share with her of what's happened with her two granddaughters and now two great grandsons. And oh, man, there's a lot that's gone on that I would love to share with my mom. But my grief is lighter because I know in my heart that there was nothing critically important left unsaid between my mom and me. It really has made a difference in my emotional well-being to know that I didn't miss that opportunity. I think otherwise I would have had, you know, uh, frankly, what I define as complicated grief. Uh, which is in so, you know, there's a lot of different types of complicated grief, but so much of it is about the would haves, could haves, what ifs, the, re, you know, regrets, uh, recriminations, the opportunities missed. And so, you know, why wait? Right? Exactly. Such an important message because none of us, we, none of us knows the future. We don't know how much time we have with any of our loved ones. And, and this is work we could be doing right now. And I, and I was going to ask if you feel once you do some of the really hard work of forgiving someone, does it get any easier with other people? Or do you, do you find it easier to practice more often? Yes, it definitely gets easier. I do think, I'm going to come back to the very first uh, thing I, I said, which is, that we really have to accept ourselves as imperfect um, and live fully within our human condition, right? And, and I am, I mean, here, here I'm very personal, uh, I'm sharing here, but, you know, I, I, I try to be loving. I think I am a loving person and I try to be kind and gentle with people, but I, I incarnated in a cranky body, right? I, I, I am a hot responder, right? And, and it's been very helpful in my adult years to recognize that. I am imperfect in this, well, in several ways. <laughs> but one of the ways I'm imperfect is I tend to get ir irritated and snap at people in ways that I often regret, Right. Accepting oneself as imperfect makes it easier to ask for forgiveness, but also easier to accept that the person you're talking with is also imperfect and to, you know, have some mercy here, you know, or lighten up, as they say. It's really wonderful advice. Yeah, definitely. And um, you, you wrote in the book about people asking you questions. I think a lot of 
uh, you've responded to questions people have come up with over the years as they as they've read the book but what if their loved one has dementia or they're in a coma uh, is it still valuable to have these conversations when the other person obviously can't respond and they don't know if the other person is hearing it or not yeah i'd say two things uh first is just to say um you're taking care of your side of the relationship you can only ever do so um in in saying i hope you can forgive me i forgive you thank you for our relationship and all you've done for me and all the times we've shared and and i love you none of those um statements really require a verbal response right in working with people with moderate to advanced dementia we can't expect them or ask them to say something back to us because it may well be beyond their you know uh diseased brains ability to do it i have the second point i'd make here is don't count them out i have been surprised more times than i can remember that in sitting with somebody very patiently in saying things that are very spacious and loving and and non-demanding to people boy sometimes they surprise you um i have this whole collection of of uh, stories that i call lucid moments where people with pretty advanced dementia for 30 seconds seem to step out of their dementia and uh and respond uh i've told some of those stories i think there's one really good one in the four things about a uh um uh father son and the father is quite demented and and the son just talks to him and takes him on drives and they he reminisces for him about times things that they did at work and every once in a while his father comes up with a zinger that's just right on the money right don't count them out. So yes, they may not be hearing you. They may be well beyond it. You may well never get a response. I'm not sure that some of this doesn't leak through. Yeah, I, I feel that way too. And sometimes I don't know how to describe it, but sometimes I've seen changes in the person, in the person being spoken to like lower blood pressure or heart rate going down or seeming to be more comfortable or more at peace sometimes after after a loved one talks to them in this way and to me i've always believed it it, it makes some kind of difference whether we're we can measure it or whether we're aware of it or not yes i think if you're just quiet and attentive spending time with somebody accompanying somebody with significant dementia, um, one will notice that they're, they go through moods as well. And what the other thing I'd say about dementia, it's a little bit off topic from the four things, though not entirely, is that more people than we realize with severe dementia are still capable of joy. Mm. They may not remember who they their family is they don't remember their zip code they don't remember seeing you last week or what they had for breakfast but not uncommonly you know uh, uh put a a puppy in their arms or a baby in their lap or you know give them a piece of chocolate cake and you see real joy so, you know, in my own practice and in my, you know, teaching around caring for people with dementia, I'm really strong at going directly for the joy. I love that. That's just such a beautiful reminder. And and I wanted to ask you one last thing, because you mentioned the fifth thing <laughs> that isn't in this book, but fifth thing of saying goodbye. Well, it is in the book. It is. So, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you asked me a little bit about the publishing of this book. So this book was called throughout the whole writing of it. I had written a proposal and we and I got a, you know, 
modest contract from Simon and Schuster to write this thing, which is really lovely, and and uh, took two years to write the darn thing. And um, but it, throughout the entirety of the writing, it was called um, "Saying Four Things Before Goodbye." Hmm. And there still is a chapter called "Goodbye" in the book because it's a very valuable thing to say. But as this thing was going to press, the galleys had been approved. It was, I mean, everything was done. And I got a call from my editor saying, Ira, we have to change the title. I, I said, change the title? W what do you mean? The thing is in galleys. I mean, how, how can we change? We have to get the word goodbye out of the title. I said, well, but, but goodbye, it goes through the book saying, you know, four things before goodbye. That phrase is, is in the book about four or five different places. We said, yeah, yeah, it's fine to be in the book. We just have to get it out of the title. I said, what happened? She said, well, the marketing people say that if goodbye is in the book, this book is going to end up in the death and dying ghetto of the bookstores. Mm. Uh, and it'll never sell. I said, but we're trying to change the culture. She said, yeah, 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 we're going to change the culture, but people <laughs> have to read it, buy it and read it first. Okay. So we thought about, you know, what do we say? And then, so it became, instead of um, the four things before goodbye, it became the four things that matter most. Um, because, and and the brilliance here, by the way, I, I do think there was, I don't want to give the marketing people any credit, but I, <laughs> but I do think <laughs> that uh, it's important to realize that if you've said the four things, and somebody dies suddenly, like my mom did. It, it's it's still okay. There is there is not still nothing left unsaid, right? You didn't get a chance to say goodbye, but okay. Um, you said the four things that you say before you say goodbye. So right, and yeah. I, I you know I think in the book I talk about goodbye being you know. Uh, nobody knows exactly where it, it came from, but it may have been, you know, God be with you uh, or God bless you and a kind of a contraction over time of that. Uh, but it is a it is a way of of saying go and be well. Right. So saying goodbye to somebody is really a, a, also a beautiful thing if you do it with that sort of conscious intention. Mm, I love that. I'm so glad you shared that story because it, it is kind of fascinating to get that glimpse into um, the publishing world in a way and how how they might help shape our progress as we're trying to move forward in these conversations. But perhaps that's why the book has been so popular. People are willing to pick it up and look at it because they're not they're not fearful of it based on the title. Well. I, I hope so. I, I'm very gratified. I, I do still get the occasional letter from somebody who has, uh, you know, read the book and used it, um, and uh, and for whom it's 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 mattered. Um, you know, I, I have. To, let me tell you one last story. I think we're, our time is about up, but I want to share one thing. Uh, I got a letter from a woman, not more than. I don't know, a handful of months ago. And she wrote me and she said, Dr. Bach, you may not remember me, but uh, three years ago, I wrote you and I told you that I'd read your book, uh, but that I have a very difficult relationship with my son and my son has had his own uh, emotional problems and he's basically disowned me. And, uh, and uh, I would love to, I, I can forgive him and I would love to make, um, um, you know, reconnect with him and, and make amends, but he won't even talk to me. And I, you know, do you have any advice? And, and what I wrote her back was, you know, same things we've talked about here, Karen, you can only take care of your side of any relationship. Um, you can have expectations. Um, it, since this is a really painfully fractured relationship it may not be the best thing to start with a phone call or visit anyway you may want to put this stuff in writing so that you can be sure that the hot emotions of the moment don't take you off message so you know you're you're his mom you don't 
you know, you, you you don't have to worry about violating boundaries, right? Just what I said drove my me crazy with my mom, but it, but it's true. She's my mom. She didn't have to have respect boundaries, <laughs> right? Um, and so send him Christmas cards or birthday cards and emphasize that you love him and that you're grateful for him and, you know, and don't expect anything in return. So I get this letter a few months ago and she said, I'm just writing now to say it worked. Mm. It took three years. Wow. But darn it. By golly, my son wrote me and he, uh, and he told me he'd love to visit and that he forgave me for uh, the things that made him angry and he really would love to reconnect. And Dr. Baya, we have a relationship again. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. And that's such good evidence that first of all, it's never too late to say these right. four things, but it's also never too early. So all of us should be thinking about it now and thinking about what what can we do to work toward healing of, of some of our relationships. Exactly. Today is a good day to do it. Well, I would encourage everyone listening who hasn't read the book yet. I mean, even though it's <laughs> been around almost 20 years, some people have not discovered it or haven't read it. So it's The Four Things That Matter Most by Dr. Ira Bayok. And you can still get it from, I mean, from Amazon, but I'm sure any bookstore could order it for you. Yeah, any, so. you know, any bookseller. Um, I also have, as you know, I have a website, irabayak.org. Um, I think, in fact, you can link to a bookseller from it, though I'm here, I'm sitting here saying this, I'm not entirely sure of that, but, but there is a blurb about the book. Uh, on the website and lots of articles and other things that I've written are there too, if you're interested. Yeah, definitely. Wonderful book. And it would be a great book to do, read for a book club and have a discussion about it too, I think. Well, Ira, thank you so much for joining me again. It's such a pleasure to talk to you as always. It's always a pleasure, Karen. Thank you for asking again. I, I hope this has been of value to the people listening. Um, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be on the End of Life University podcast. And I, I'll look forward to my, my next uh, visit with you. All right. We'll start planning it now. <laughs> Take okay. care. All right. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Ira Bayak about the four things that matter most. It's a truly inspirational book. I encourage you to get it if you don't have it on your bookshelf already. And be sure to share this content with anyone else that you think might enjoy tuning in. Uh, once again, subscribe, leave ratings and reviews, and make a donation at eoluniversity.com support if you're able. We'll see you the next time. Bye-bye.